Oh, girl, so you already know what the new narrative is all about. Yes, your so questions you know... are good, Lolo. I'm excited about this. Yes! I did add a couple more questions because I thought about them, but I forgot to send them. So just run I'll with them, with okay? okay? Yeah, there we go. L listen, roll with me. That's what it's about. Yes. Um, so what I really want everyone in this chat to be prepared for and get excited about is that we're, because the new narrative is all about talking to people with disabilities and those, you know, who are, uh, who love us and who are part of the community directly to really share what our narrative of disability is about that isn't about the ableist perspective that has been brainwashed in society since the beginning of time. So this is like some real game changing shit. All right. Yeah. And so I really was thinking about the people that I wanted to interview. And of course, you were one of the first people to come to mind because what you do for fashion and disability is absolutely monumental. I know how you've changed my style and my fashion because, girl, we used to fight. We used to really, <laughs> we used to battle it out um, <laughs> over what to wear, what should I wear, what colors, all these things. And I feel like, a big part of that battle was because I never knew how to properly dress myself. It wasn't until I met you and started getting styled by you that I learned like, oh shit, I need to be paying attention to this or I could look at this and realize, you know, this is something that I could wear. This is probably not the best thing. Drisha, what's up? And all of those different things. So um, I thought it would be really great for you to share your knowledge and skill set you know, um, as much as you're willing to share, of course, um, to to get people excited about, one, to get people with disabilities excited about dressing, two, yeah. for people who may be able-bodied to understand how we dress ourselves, and if they have someone in their family, they can, you know, give tips to them on, on how to dress themselves, and then once it's time for this quarantine to come out, everybody's going to want to put on a best fit. I know I'm ready for it. So I think this is perfect timing for yes. us to really discuss fashion and how we can move forward, you know, looking good and stuff. So that's my spiel. Okay. <laughs> and so I just want to first and foremost start off with what exactly is a disability fashion stylist? Because like I said, I was diagnosed at 14 and I knew nothing about it until I met you. And I met you when I was like, 28 so i know there's probably a lot of people who don't understand exactly what that is so break it down for the people okay uh thank you again lauren for having me on your inaugural uh show i'm really honored and i'm always happy to talk about uh disability and let me know if it gets too dark in here i can open another light but if it looks good with this, okay good yeah so, it looks great Disability fashion stylist is a coin, a, a term that I actually coined um, mm -hmm. in the early 2000s. So my journey is a little different. I'm also a congenital amputee, missing digits on my right hand and feet. And to no fault of my parents or my community, who I think was really trying to be supportive, I was always kind of noted as someone as an overcomer. Mm -hmm. So that was my narrative. My narrative was, I'm an overcomer. And then one day I looked around and thought, well, what the hell am I overcoming? This is just how I'm made, you know? And so that's a whole nother level of acceptance. And I think that we have such an ableist society because we're never taught about disability. So right. you know, if you're watching this right now, can you think of a class that you've taken where you've been taught about disability, where it's been something that's been discussed, not as something to feel sorry for, or only as a medical condition, but disability as a culture. So um, I started styling people with disabilities haphazardly because I started asking people were the clothes were they wearing easy to put on and take off? Was it something that was medically safe? Was it something that they loved? And these three questions after being, you know, at the time denied by the fashion industry, they weren't really into dressing with disabilities in the late 90s, early 2000s. So mm -hmm. after, being denied by them, I had to come up with something. I said, you know what, I need to be able to do something. And unbeknownst to me, there had not been a stylist for people with mm. disabilities. I didn't know it. I wasn't trying to be groundbreaking. I was just right. trying to help people. And since I exactly. knew I didn't want to design, I needed to do something where I could have a direct impact. I love that. And, and break down the difference between 
design and styling because I think people get those two mixed up yeah. a lot, especially with reference to the work that you do okay. and the work that I do. People are like, oh, can you design these clothes? And I'm like, well, I don't design. Okay, well, can you help style me? And I'm like, well, I'm not. I just wear yeah. stuff. So yeah. break down that little difference between uh, designing and styling and especially with reference to um, adaptive clothing and dressing with a disability. Okay, so that's that's a, an awesome question. So basically styling, I look at science, I look at uh, styling as the art and science of styling, right? There are mm -hmm. color stories, um, there's fit, and then there's function. And then for disability, uh, there's, I describe body types as follows. Seated body types, that could be people who are ambulatory wheelchair users, that could be anyone that has to sit for the majority of the time. You're going to need different things with your clothing. Uh, your fabrics are not going to be fabrics that put off the scent after a while. There'll, there'll need mm. to be some wicking elements to the fabrics. There'll need to be pants higher in the back or longer crotch area, higher waist, little things like that to help with the, the seated body type. Or a little woman that may actually need you know toddler size shoes that will allow her to dress up for work or do different things like that i'm only using those couple of examples to kind of give people an actual idea of what the work is it's actually me co-creating a visual story using clothes accessories and footwear love it love it designing love it. itself is obviously working to manufacture and sell clothes. Can I design, could I work with a design team? Absolutely. But what I do with you guys is I feel like it's more of co-creation. I mm -hmm. try to pay attention to who you are and let you guide me on how to best assist you to uh, challenge you to be the person that you've described to me that you see in your head. I love that. I love that. And I love that you said that you help us become and look like the person we see in our head because i think that's the biggest thing whether disability or not when yeah. we dress the person we see in our head for some reason does not translate when it comes to the stuff that we buy and the way yeah. that we put it together and i think especially more for people with disabilities because our entire archetype of our style and how we dress is always based on an able body type and can we and talk so, about that? You asked me about that. I'm, I'm sorry to interject, but I did yeah. not address that question. With regards to adaptive clothing, the reason why I developed my disability fashion styling system, which I described a minute ago when I talked about accessible, smart, and fashionable clothing, is because yeah. there are not enough adaptive options today. We have way more today than we've had in a long time. But I'm going to ask you a really quick question, and I'm looking at my watch. I'm going to time you. I want you okay. to name five top mainstream adaptive designers and go tommy hilfiger you got a lot of time left uh, <laughs> tommy that's hilfiger. the point <laughs> that's the point right there the point is right that, um there was a time though i want to tell you about there was a time between the 1950s and 1976 there was this mm -hmm. era of functional fashion, right? For all of my yeah. fashion students or people that are just interested in history, functional fashion was actually spearheaded by Muriel Zimmerman. It's National Occupational, well, last month was National Occupational Therapy Month and a mainstream designer who was also deaf. And her name was Helen mm. Cookman. And Helen Cookman used to design patch pockets on her clothes to be able to put her hearing aid apparatus mm. in it. And she worked alongside the, um, the fashion editor of the New York Times during that time. And her name was, I jotted it down so I wouldn't forget, Virginia Pope. And her and Virginia oh. Pope worked with 30 mainstream designers. Today, we have Tommy, Izzy, different people that are doing amazing work, a lot of moms and pops all over the world. But then it was 30 people, Lolo, 30 mm -hmm. major designers. And the difference is, is that they didn't have social media. They didn't have mm. marketing. They didn't have the apparatus that we have in place to be able to tell these stories. So we are really just hearkening back to the work of people that have come before us. I love that. I love that. And I love that, you know, that there is at least a history behind all of this. Because, yes. I mean, even though the history may not be as 
marketed or as well known as as other designers or, or stories of that nature it's good to know that people were at least being considered back yeah. then and i think it's almost even our responsibility now as influencers with social media internet the whole nine to take it upon ourselves to really push for the brands that we see that are doing it right yeah. and even brands that that are doing it right without maybe even knowing that they're doing it right yeah yeah and which we've come across before where we're like oh wait this is technically adaptive clothing but they didn't even like fucking realize it um so yeah um, that's a whole nother that was very pre-covid 19 right uh, very I, I had a lot of stuff to say about that but i'm interested to see where we go from here so yeah you're absolutely right yeah and, and i think um and what i really want to know too you know as we're talking about clothes and how they're being uh you know designing and everything else what is kind of because i get a lot of men that come in my chats too yeah what is there is there or maybe there's not i don't know but what is the difference between menswear and women's wear with regard to um create like actually designing the adaptive functionality maybe or just um clothing in general like because i know with men you know obviously men's clothes tend to be a little bit more comfier it's always like cotton shirts or something like <laughs> you know yeah. something of that nature um so i tend to gravitate to graphic t-shirts which i know you can't stand but no, no, no. i'm wearing one today did you notice that <laughs> yes i did the the instagram share black story that definitely did <laughs> yes. Yes. but I, i'm the queen of a good graphic t-shirt but nonetheless is there a difference between men's wear design and women's wear design and how it could help when shopping using your um disability fashion styling system which you slightly touched on but you didn't give like the whole breakdown so i want you to break down the system and then okay. how it can be applied male and female wear okay so that's a good question so basically the foundation of my work is my disability fashion styling method that's my whole you know my side intellectual property those are things that i use that i research and i come up with out of that I wanted to find something that I could share openly and publicly that would be able to help people with disabilities, mm -hmm. caregivers, occupational therapists. So after being basically told to take several seats by the fashion department, <laughs> and the, it was it was kind of hilarious now, not then, but you know, they right. would fly me out and, oh, you're going to design for disability. And they just would never take my calls again. I was just mm -hmm. like, Lord, you got to help me come up with something that can actually help people. And as a result, you know, I started researching this stuff in 1992. Right, right, so right. You've been in the game. Yeah, over the years, I had been asking people those three questions. Well, is it easy to put on and take off? So that's where we got accessible, which is the first mm -hmm. pillar of my styling system. And then I would say, well, is it smart? Smart for your health? Is it medically safe? And that's the second pillar. And then the mm -hmm. third, which most people weren't asking people, Lolo, which is, do you love it? Mm. Does it work with your body type and your lifestyle? I'll never forget, I was at an independent center in Virginia, and they mm. wanted me to do a fashion show, late 90s, early 2000s. And I said, well, this particular model, before I, re before I meet her, tell me what her favorite colors are. And they said, she stopped and had a long pause and she said, I don't know her favorite colors. I said, well, look around the room and see what colors are in the room. And she yeah. said, oh, she has a lot of purples and pinks. I said, okay, well, go ask her what her favorite colors are. And then the girl um, asked, the uh, occupational therapist asked the model what her favorite color was and she was telling her pinks and purples and she really loves uh, magenta, just really going on. And it was almost as if no one had ever asked her that. Mm, that's a damn shame. The young lady lived with um, a developmental disability, but no one had ever asked her. I said, well, what are you dressing her in? She said, just gray sweats. And I said, I'm going to need you to please not do that. 
Yikes. Please don't do that. But that was what people would tell them. And I used to have this saying, back away from the sweats. Now they're cute, so we can we can get what I'm but right. Right. Um, that's right. <laughs> so that's the styling system. That's where mm -hmm. it's birthed from. With regards to men, you know what I mm -hmm. find for men? I hmm. usually get men's girlfriends, wives, family members that ask me about men. And mm. that's how I wind up helping them. But men's clothing in general is a bit different from ours. Their, their clothing is based, in my opinion, a lot of it was based more on actual measurements. Mm. Whereas women's clothing tends to be kind of vanity style. I mean, vanity sizing. Have you ever gone to a store and a size two is one way, and then you go to yes. another store, and that size two is really a size 10, but to make you feel better, it's like, oh, this is a two. You're like, I know this right. is a two, but I'm going to take it because that's, you know, it's vanity uh, sizing, whereas with men, the neck measurement, is it a 14, is it a 16? You know, and a mm -hmm. lot of men that are wheelchair users tend to have larger necks, and if they weren't born with a disability, I, mm -hmm. I, I love to work with my male clients because I'll say, well, what's your neck size? I, I'm probably still like... 14. I said, how long have you been in a wheelchair? And they'll tell me like two, three years. Well, those muscles in your neck, when you use a manual wheelchair, those muscles yeah. expand. Mm, they your expand. Arm, yeah. Your arm muscle span. So men is more measurement, women vanity sizing. You have to take into account, get your measurements, men. That's yeah. my number one advice to men, especially when you're trying to dress shirts and different things like that. Know right. your measurements. Mm, come on measurements yes yes I think everyone should but for men in particular that's yeah. one of the things especially when they're suiting tuxedos and things yeah. like that because you need to know all of this stuff you need to know i suggest it for women too but that's yeah. really the main difference men in my mind tend to be more bespoke than women Got you. Got you. I love that. And just really quickly for everyone who is listening, I know you guys are sending questions through the chat and a lot of you guys are chiming in. I see all of your comments. Um, hey, everyone. But also, we are going to do a Q&A um, for a few minutes towards the end. So please submit your questions in the little question thingy down there at the bottom. Um, that way we can see it and answer all your questions, whether they're for Stephanie or myself, we will we will answer. So just wanted to plug that in there because I know there's probably a lot of people that are like mind blown. Cause every time we talk, I always get a mind blowing moment because I'm like, girl, this is your shit. You know this, oh, this, is, this, is, this is next level. So I wanted to, um, talk about, especially since as we're talking, using this platform to be about the new narrative, um, I've received backlash from it. So I know for a fact that you've received stuff about it where people feel like I fashion, know right. <laughs> <laughs> where people really feel like fashion isn't important in the fight for disability inclusion and representation wait so, they don't come at me with that anymore i used to get it at the beginning but i now yeah. i don't or maybe I okay well well business. good yeah but I, I mean i've definitely gotten it before where it's like you know why are you concerned about clothes there's so many other things going on in the world with people with disabilities that we need to be concerned about and i'm always like offended by it like just like a touch like it doesn't take a lot for me to like genuinely be offended you know what i'm trying to say but it's yeah. always like why is why can't you know fighting for accessible entryways in buildings be just as important and coexist as dr having people be able to dress independently and with integrity and style so i just kind of want to get your take on how you see what you do fitting into the overall battle of people with disabilities actually being seen and respected in society yeah i mean listening to you i thought about this question because you did put that in your questions yeah uh, yeah I you did. know what lolo when you were talking I, I i just like four different answers came through my mind but i'm gonna go personal first and okay I'm, I'm gonna expand from there because i think people understand it better when mm -hmm. you share an anecdote and share your own personal story right I was in Virginia. It was 110 that day. Pedicure. What? 
Yeah, pedicure toenails. I was born without toes, so I hope I'm not ashy. If so, you guys, you guys have been ashy. That's all right, girl. Ashy. So these surgery marks right here, and this one right here. That's where the doctors took bones to actually design and create toes for me, right? So mm -hmm. I actually have three toes on one foot and four on the other. Mm -hmm. And I'm able, uh, the toes that most people have that allow them to have balance, I don't have. Gotcha. So, um, if you were thinking about it logically, I should actually be toppling over. So mm -hmm. I did wear uh, special shoes when I was little in order to assist me with being able to ambulate independently. So I wanted to give you that background because I'm in an elevator, small elevator. Remember when we could get in an elevator with people? I know, girl. Okay, okay, I'm back. Um, yes, but yes. I'm in a small <laughs> elevator in Virginia. This woman who looks like, you know, she could be my grandmother. She says, you should be ashamed of yourself. Cover your damn feet. No. I'm not, making, I'm not making that up. So I was just like, what do oh, you she do? It. I'm not going to be disrespectful. I just wasn't raised that way. And I think I was oh. just more stunned than, yeah. than even hurt. Yeah. And the two people, there, were, there was a person here, a person there, and she was standing right next to me. And yeah. then they just looked down automatically. So you know how your body just gets hot and all of the heat just yeah. rises to yeah. your face? And I, yeah. I didn't even want to cry. You know what I felt like? Hmm. You know how when... Even if you're not walking, but yeah. when you're in your chair and you got that extra, I yeah. walked up that elevator like. <laughs> right. Bitch, say something about my toes. Right. I walked up with my, my back straight and my head up. Mm -hmm. Unlike when I was in college, when guys would be like, man, I think you're fine, but your feet fucked up. Or like, say like that to me. I was yeah. Feel yeah. Depleted. I really felt like, you know what? It's all good. Yeah. That's her opinion. And yeah. me walking in the integrity and the dignity that God gave me mm -hmm. says to her, you have no control over my narrative, which brings that me part. to the next point. Robin Gavon, who is a amazing Pulitzer Prize winning fashion critic, by the way, she's the only mm -hmm. fashion critic with a Pulitzer Prize. Come she on. wrote an article that actually sparked my idea for my new COVID-19 series on my podcast. But her title alone answers their question. The title of her article is, Our Clothes Tell Our Story. What happens mm. when the narrative is just sweats and pajamas? Back in the mm. day, that's what they would put people with disabilities in. If you think about caste systems in Europe and different parts of the world, how people that were wealthy wore one color and people that were not as wealthy or poor or working mm. class wore another color. It was to yeah. separate and to keep people identifiably, I'm better than you. So like mm. it or not, my neck is starting to roll. Like it or Girl, not. Girl, let it roll. <laughs> like it or not, this is the society that we live in, period. So people with, different, with disabilities are no different, except remember when we were doing that photo shoot with uh, Lauren Janae? Yes. Uh, and we were- Shout out to Erica and Brittany. Yeah, we were at the corner and this woman was like, oh, where you get those shoes from? Oh, I love that skirt. Yes. There was no, yes. even though a, a wheelchair for me and for you and for other people, even though I don't use it, when I see it, I think freedom and independence. Some people think, oh, I need to feel sorry for her, that poor girl. She didn't even look at your wheelchair. Exactly. She completely exactly. saw you and she acknowledged right. you. Because people right. that are not familiar with disabilities, when they see that you're deaf or when they know that you live with autism or they see you use a crutch or a cane, for whatever reason, they also associate that with your cognitive ability. Right. And your ability to be successful. So right. what they don't understand, these people that are saying that, is that we live in a world where our clothes do tell our story. You can't go into an interview with crinkly shirts. And right. you know, when you're sitting down, your shirts are shifting because the clothes in, aren't designed for sitting. You can't have ill-fitting clothes and then try to compete in the same way. Right, right. So right. it is important. I think of it as the social psychology of dressing. And you know I can mm -hmm. go on, so I'll just stop there. But yes, <laughs> it's all good. No, it, it's it's wonderful, and I'm glad that, that you're saying this because I don't think a lot of people, disability or not, 
really realize the importance of dressing and style and what it's really saying yeah. to the world when you show up with whatever y'all are wearing. And that's actually a great question, Tay, because I was literally about to go I just into saw that him. next. Yeah. Yeah, I was literally about to go into that next since we are um, touching on the topic of appropriateness and people approaching people with disabilities and how they talk and um, and what to use and that kind of thing. And um, it was actually interesting because this just happened. I'm not going to put them on blast, but um, I did just get a comment today that I had to teach someone because... Um, I posted a picture and he said, uh, you're the most beautiful, flyest woman or something like that, a flyest woman in a wheelchair I've ever seen. And so I responded and said, well, damn, I have more work to do because I want to be the flyest woman you've ever seen, period. Yeah. And he was like, oh, thank you for checking me on that. I should have been better with my words and blah, blah, blah. So I think there's those subtle things that a lot of times people don't realize that they're doing and they're thinking they're complimenting, but can come off offensive. So for those who are able-bodied and even other people in the disability community still don't even yeah, know. That's all of us, right. That's everybody. Um, proper language to use. Um, what are the proper, um, what is the proper language? Whether when you're conversing with someone and especially with regards to dressing with um, disabilities because you use seated body types versus wheelchair bound you know what i mean there's a yeah. huge oh, difference yeah, between let's do the that two. let's do that yeah so uh, i so i want to hear from your professional things? advice how do people talk appropriately to each other okay so um before we jump into that if you're listening to what lolo said about the gentleman's comment and you didn't think that it was offensive for him to say uh in a in a wheelchair just think about it like gender or ethnicity like when yes. someone says oh you're so pretty to be dark skinned or right oh, you're so cute to be Kirby or oh, right. you're so, whatever the whatever the disqualifier is that's right. the same thing for disability so remember Kylie Jenner did a photo shoot a photo op in a wheelchair and yes. she was saying that it's like she feels bound well right. that's because the narrative around assistive technology is not that it gives people freedom but that it is somehow hinders them so here's what mm -hmm. I would say starting let's let's start culturally guys so when you're okay. thinking about people with disabilities, even the Center for Disease Control has a way that they discuss disability. And that's known as people first language. They discuss it with person with a disability, person that lives with autism, person that, and you fill in the blanks. And the reason why they said, and even APA uses that, the APA guide, which is used in journalism. A lot of the, the ideas behind people first language back in the day was that people with disabilities were still being put in these institutions, right? Mm, and and mm -hmm. you may not know this about me, Lolo, but I was actually trained for almost a year to be a lobbyist for advocacy oh. for disability. So I visited those institutions. I learned mm -hmm. a lot of stuff about that. And, and humanity was not associated with disability. So in an mm -hmm. effort to associate humanity with disability, people first language became this thing. And there are a lot of backstories to it and a lot of different people tell it in different ways. But here's what I would say to you. If you want to make sure that you are not making any mistakes, I would stick with people first language. But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about identity first language, which is something that's happening right now. People with, with I'm using people first language, people with autism don't want to say, they don't want you to say people with autism. They want you to mm -hmm. say autistic. Deaf people want you to say deaf because that's part of their identity. They're not apologizing for it and it doesn't take away from their humanity. Now, if you're just mm -hmm. listening to me and you're like, okay, hell, I'm more confused than I was when you started. <laughs> Here's the thing to keep in mind. I tell this to my students all the time. When you think of disability, think of disability as a culture. No culture right. is a monolith. You can't say black people and only have one kind of idea of what it means to be black. Right, right, That's right. Now, if you right. are xenophobic and racist, then you might have an idea that all black people eat chicken and watermelon and blah, 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 right. blah or whatever your xenophobia is, or whatever your racism is. But in reality, that's not it. 
So when you right. think of disability, think about it as a diverse culture. And you guys know mm -hmm. the way that you deal with gender nowadays, how people mm -hmm. say, what's your pronoun? Yeah, yeah. Everyone does not believe in assigned cisgender norms, right? Am I saying right. that correctly? So yeah, yeah. It, think about disability the same way. Say, hey, Lolo, uh, what do you prefer? When I'm mm -hmm. writing about you, talking about you, how, ask people, ask the individual, but when you look at disability as a culture, as a culture, it's still standard for people first language, but there is a huge mm -hmm. movement within the disability community to move towards identity first language. Let me ask you, Lolo, do you prefer mm -hmm. person with a disability or disabled? Um, I'm cool with either one, to be honest. Yeah, Sometimes I just say I'm disabled or as a person with a disability, like I'm cool with it either way. The The ones that trigger me is handicap, Avi. Um, you know where that came handicap, from? Yes, yes. I, I, yeah. Um, so um, handicap bothers me, which is a general thing. A lot of people with disabilities that I know don't like that that verbiage and um, cripple. Some people have embraced the word cripple. I, that's a trigger word for me. Yeah. I, that, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not into that. <laughs> yeah, and, and so here's, you guys, just real quick. Moms, dads, grandmas, a lot of times there was this movement that came, special mm. needs, um, mm -hmm. this apologetic language around disabilities. Nobody has to apologize for me. I don't know how right. you take this, Lolo, but if this is the oh, way that I'm, you know me. Yeah, that I'm created, there's no apology needed. So that's Facts. when you hit special needs. I would stay away from that. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't, don't say, oh, this is a person with a special need. Don't. Because yeah. anything that sounds apologetic or as if you're making an excuse for it, it's just like walking up to somebody that's black going, oh, you poor minority. You no, know, like, it's like, you, you. Do you know how angry I would be if somebody came up to me and said that? <laughs> yeah, but like when people say, um, differently abled, mm -mm, mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. do that. That's coming yeah. from kind of parents because they want to protect. But people in the yeah. community and some people with disabilities that were born with disabilities or not, it's like, don't use the word disabled with me because cars are disabled on the side of the road. So. so <laughs> I'm I'm just I'm just yeah I'm just trying to let you know that it is a minefield. So take a yeah. breath and relax. If that is really stressing you out, here's how you remove the stress. Disability as a culture, yeah. Society still uses people first language. The community is pushing back with identity first language. That's one pot. Anything yeah. else, you ask the individual, what do you prefer? Got you. Got you. And th and that's actually a great tip because I, you know, I've heard and used differently able. Again, that's just something that I'm comfortable with and yeah. have used before. Um, and I've seen other people use it before. And that's the thing, too, is even with my journey with having a disability, I my journey started at 14. So I was like growing up into a teenager and into an adult learning. And, and to be completely honest, I really didn't learn about disability until I started my YouTube like three years ago. So it is one of those things where it's like, I can see where the, the confusion lies and you know, what do you say? What do you not say? And all of that kind of thing. So, but I really, really like the, the way you put it that, um, don't use words that make it feel like you're sorry for, or it's apologetic for their existence. Right. I really like that kind of understanding of it, even for myself moving forward when I talk about disability, because people ask me that question all the time. And I'm like, and sometimes I feel stuck because I'm like, I know what I'm comfortable with. Yeah. But it does, it does range to different people. But I think ultimately what you said, first and foremost, is just ask that person. Yeah, like, for sure. Just simply ask. And yeah. I think as well, just if I can give a little tidbit to add to that, is if you are approaching a person with a disability, that's how I use my language. If you're a per approaching a person with a disability and you want to say, give a compliment, or you want to say hi, or you want to offer help, or whatever the case is, approach it as you are addressing another person any other time. 
There you go. That was kind of where right. that whole uh, story where Stephanie was saying that the girl complimented me because of how I dressed. It had nothing to do with the wheelchair, none of that stuff. It was simply about what I was wearing. And that's the appropriate way to approach people from a more social standpoint right. um, is to truly just see them as people first. And trust, we, 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 we know when you're approaching us because you want to feel like you're going to be our friend in the party tonight. Like, it's, it's that's a whole other topic. Sorry, we getting off the fashion at this point. But <laughs> essentially, essentially, it's about um, being appropriate by asking the question first. Yeah. And then um, in social settings, simply treating the person as you would your friend, your cousin, your whatever, whatever. So... I, that, I think that was a great topic that we went down because it was it was necessary because a lot of people don't know what that is. So um, as we're starting to wrap up, and again, you guys, please, please, please submit your questions down below in the app down here. We have uh, a, one or two questions so far that we've seen, but please, please add it in the app so we can answer them for you. Um, what is your hope for the fashion industry with regards to adaptive wear and representation? I want authentic rep representation. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is I don't mean, you know, someone made a comment like you, I will not put them on blast, but someone that I really respect, they were just like, there needs to be this in the fashion industry. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I need back up. Right. We, we need to we need to have trained people. I mean, people with disabilities should have skill sets just yeah. like anyone else. So I want authentic representation. I don't know what post COVID marketing and, you know, what the supply chains will look like within the disability community. My in my mind, in my gut, I feel like it's going to become more local. So people are yeah. gonna look, reaching out to people like you, me, other people, tastemakers, influencers. I'm not an influencer, but more of a tastemaker. Don't mm -hmm. don't hire us and then put us on your social media feed. But then when it's time to really drop coin for that's colloquialism, when it's really time to pay people yeah be a part of an actual campaign you need to hire us facts facts because Absolutely. putting putting us on social media and then stories and putting hearts next to it is not going to pay any bill so we need to be a part of the authentic conversation and then get rid of the word inclusivity and just sit down and read a book read a book <laughs> about what it means you know, start reading online. I have a great website. You can go there for some resources. Um, yes. Uh, it'll probably be up tomorrow, depending on if it turns over. We're going to talk about that for sure. Yeah. Okay. But they just need to be more curious and mm -hmm. see people with disabilities as fashion customers. You cannot design for or market to someone you do not see and you can't see someone you don't value. Stop thinking that we are an afterthought. That we that are part. not the sexy customer, that we are not. Because every time we spend our money, hmm. it's the same. Hmm. It's so the that, same. That's what I want. I love that. I, I literally love that because you are absolutely right. Because that's what it is. It's like you use what brands have done before is use images of people with disabilities as like a way to say, hey, uh, we see you too, but then like there's nothing for us to shop for, and you're not They're hiring us. On runways, stop putting people on runways like they're spectacles. If you're gonna put someone on a runway, can you put them on a runway? And if you don't know if you have clothing for people with disabilities already, and you want to be a part of this conversation, just hire me. I can curate your stuff. I can go through it. You probably won't even have to spend any money. But if I see another person on a runway and it's only being celebrated because they're there, yes, do that, does that help change the narrative? Absolutely, because people never see people with disabilities. But if, right. if, I, if I have a client and I see someone on a Chanel runway, which I haven't, but if I see someone with a disability on a Chanel runway and I have a, a luxury buying client, they're going to be like, oh, Steph, I want to get that thing that they had on the runway. Oh, Chanel doesn't sell this for you. You get where I'm going? Exactly. Exactly. And I know runways and all of that are going to change post COVID, but I'm just saying, come on, can we, right. we need to step it up? 
Right. I, I 100% agree. 100, 100% agree. So as we're talking about that, please tell us about this new website that is launching that is going to be full of resources for people to essentially come back and learn about everything we just talked about and then some um from you specifically and, and other influencers and stuff so break down your curatable brand the website that is launching and your podcast all right so i am a solopreneur that is really blessed to be connected to an amazing global you know uh source of other entrepreneurs and people that I collaborate with. Lolo is one of the curators. And basically what Curatable is, Curatable.com. Curatable, the company, just provides styling and dressing solutions for people with disabilities and their caregivers. I want to mm -hmm. empower and I want to educate the industry. That's it. I don't want to beat anybody up. I don't want to call them ableist and knock them down. I just want, I just want people with disabilities to be a part of that conversation so that we mm -hmm. can change how people see people with disabilities. So curatable.com, uh, the, the new curatable.com. Yes. It, it truly is my happy place. I'm not writing. I'm not writing with other people in mind. I'm actually mm -hmm. sharing with you the things that I muse over the things that I'm paying attention to. So when someone's writing about face masks, everyone's talking about face masks and PPE. Thank God the fashion industry is turning to that. But when I see that, I see, welcome to healthwear fashion industry. You've been afraid of healthwear, but you're now making masks. You're making them fashionable. That's all we mm -hmm. wanted. Keep it coming. Don't leave us after this is over because we will get right. through this and we will still need masks. But there are other things that people that our designers can do in the healthcare industry. So I give people an insight into how I'm looking at things. When I see mm -hmm. loungewear, for instance, one of the articles on the, the platform, when I see loungewear, I think that's a gateway design into universally designed clothing because a lot of loungewear exactly. has very few fasteners. Yes. And Fast. that's that people often ask, they're like, oh, can you style me? Can I work with you? And mm -hmm. I often, I'm, a, I'm one person, so I put uh, shopping sliders on my website, meaning that I'm just going to curate things. And right now, I'm only working with shop style or something like that. So okay. I'm using only that platform. So I don't have access to every single thing, whatever will work with that in my slider. And I curate clothing for seated body types, mm -hmm. standing body types with crutches, one arm, whatever it is. Uh, and various body types, including little people, so on and so forth. And so you can just come there and you can shop. I think when you shop, I get a little something. I don't think I'm going to be uh, wealthy if you purchase one thing, but I think cumulatively, if it adds up, it will be monetized. So keep that in mind. Yeah. But yeah, I just, I provide the things that I've wanted to see. It's the website that I've wanted to see. And my podcast, good gracious. I yes. <laughs> I won't go there. You see my face. Yeah, Lolo knows I have been recording and re-recording. And what she doesn't know is I've been doing this since 2010. I have yes. been starting podcasts and stopping them. One of my <laughs> faults is that I worked in radio previously. And so I know what audio sounds like. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm in my head and I'm in my head. And I'm like, well, people won't understand. So I just got out of my own way. And I'm not doing interviews because I do hate the quality of the audio. And so I'm That's just like, right. you know what? I'm just going to tell people what I'm seeing. And so I mm -hmm. relaunched it the first week of March. And by the third week of March, we were in our houses. And so yeah. um, the article I mentioned by Robin Gavon actually sparked the COVID-19 series. And I'm reading things and I'm talking about them. And I was like, why don't I just do that in some daily bites? So that'll go. be starting today. And the intro is up. And so I'll do daily bites just five days a week, really short, really quick, what I'm reading, and then share the links with you. And hopefully people will learn a little bit and get a different perspective. And don't just read and I'm facilitating it, but I want feedback because you know stuff that I don't know. People right. have insight that I don't have. And I would call myself an expert, not because I knew everything, but because I knew I didn't know everything, but I knew mm -hmm. questions to ask. I love that. I love that. So the website is curatable.com. And curatable is spelled C-U-R, the number eight, A-B-L-E dot com. Love it. And the, and podcast the podcast is just curatable, the podcast. And you can, if once the, 
I can't talk anymore. Site switches over. Um, what will actually happen is you click podcast and you'll see the link to the Google podcast, Apple podcast, and Spotify. You can find Love it. Love it. Love it. So just so you guys know, I just put the web address there. Um, if you follow Stephanie, I know she's going to be blasting it and promoting it um, for launch. So please, please, please check out her website because I saw a lot of questions and comments that you guys were having. And the website will definitely answer a lot of those, I'm sure. So as the final question before we get into everyone else's questions, okay. and please, again, you guys, send in your questions through the question app down at the bottom. So that way everyone can see and we can have, you know, um, a good discussion for the next few minutes before we end up having to go and spend some more time inside. But <laughs> by ourselves. But, right, exactly, by ourselves. Um, so what do you want the new narrative to be when discussing people with disabilities and fashion? The new narrative, I want people to see us as actual fashion customers. And that matters because then they're looking at us as people with disabilities, our family and our friends as people with buying power. Mm -hmm. And people with buying power have political power. People with buying power matter. So they will be making decisions based on the, the power within our group. And that helps to change the narrative. I love it. I we're love not, it. We're I not love someone it. in society that they have to take care of. And there's nothing wrong with caring for people. Our society is so whack sometimes. But we're exactly. everybody with a disability or that lives disabled is not necessarily someone that needs to be taken care of. And if you do, there's nothing wrong with that. But I just exactly. want, I want stigmas removed, Lolo. Mm -hmm. Period. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I 100% agree with you, which is why this is, something that I wanted to do, especially with just the trend of it happening right now. And, yeah. you know, seeing all the ID lives and I've been learning so much from all these different brands and all these other influencers too, that it's like, yo, people need to learn about this too. Let, let's, let's talk about this stuff and, and what it means. So um, thank you so much for that. We're getting, uh, we're going to answer this question. Okay. Oh, there's multiple questions. Okay. Um, okay, let's start with, uh, let's reading. start here. Yes, I know, girl. I was trying to read it. That's why it took me a second. I was like, oh, Lord, there's a lot of words. Um, so what are the most comfortable fly brands for people with disabilities? That's a really loaded question. But yes. What I, but what I can say is that they're not enough fly brands that are comfortable for people with disabilities. But I do like sevenable jeans. You can get those at Zappos Adaptive. I like I like some of the way Jeffrey Campbell has been reimagining his footwear with Velcro. I like the way some of Steve Madden has been reimagining. Of course you've heard of Tommy Adaptive, but that's not everyone's aesthetic. But they do right. some really nice things. I'm not knocking Tommy at all. And that's I do, a fact. I do like Magna Ready for men. I like some of the pr prints and patterns on their shirts. Magna Ready uh, has Magna Click technology, which allows mm -hmm. you to wear a button up, a full button up shirt if you have dexterity mm. challenges. And for little people, I'm really excited that people are starting to extend their shoe sizes and then have wider widths to accommodate the foot of an adult that wears a, a children's size. So unfortunately, I can't rattle them off because they are not enough, which is why I just developed my styling system. But Lolo's right, I absolutely will have them on my site. And here's the issue with that. Um, I don't know what disability you're referring to. So if I knew more specifically, I could tell you right. with specifics. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the ones that you listed off are all great brands to, to, to definitely start, start with. with. Yeah, oh, and, and, and they have some interesting brands and it, it'll at least get you started. Right. And you know what, as as you were quickly talking, quickly touch on um, adaptive technology. Okay. Like when you when you said Jeffrey Campbell was reimagining his his uh, shoes and you were excited about that. What exactly? And you were saying because of the Velcro, why is something like a Velcro or the magnet buttons? you know, considered adaptive 
for yeah. people with disabilities. And I don't want Velcro to come sue me, so I'll say hook and loop. But okay. it opens and closes like the, like, quote unquote, Velcro. Okay. Because the- Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Because yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah. got it. Yep, 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 yep. So um, I'm excited about it because it makes it accessible. When Mindy Shire connected with, you know, Maura Horton and Tommy Hilfiger and that whole collection dropped in 2015, she was using the terminology adaptive fashion because she literally works with brands to modify clothing, mm -hmm. take it from where it is, add some different fasteners and make it more accessible to people with disabilities. But anyone could wear it. It's like the Tommy collection by yeah. Zaya that was so cute. Um, so that's, that's what I mean by, that's what I mean by adaptive. It's something Love that it. it was one way, but now we add some feature, be it hook and loop, um, opening the sides of the pants with zippers, anything like that to make it more accessible. Love it. And since we're on the topic, the question Hi. gets cut off, gets cut off. Um, but she said, I need an adaptive face mask for my grandmother and myself. My grandmother has dexterity issues, but I didn't see what the rest of the question was because it cuts off after a certain amount of text. But I'm looking for I'm looking for them, Andrea. I will definitely let you know because I can't. They don't stay on my ears. I don't even know what that's about. Like my <laughs> ears are like this with those masks on. But I will let you know. I think the one that'll work best is one that has elastic that you don't have to tie. It doesn't go over your ear you're actually able to slide it on. And I think the thing is, is it has to be washable. And mm. um, I'm, cons I'm interested in that. Check with Izzy though, see what Izzy's are like, Andrea. Izzy Adaptive. Andrea. Yeah, because she has some, and I know some people that are designing some, so maybe I'll get someone to design one for Curatable because a friend of mine is about to, to do some and we can sell some adaptive ones. I'm jotting that part. Notes. Yeah, uh, please, uh, please do. Please do. Because you have to be safe when you take those masks off. I see yeah. people putting the mask everywhere. I'm like, contamination, contamination. Right, germs, <laughs> just hella germs. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, those beards. I'm oh, just kidding. Right, that part. Um, well, kind of don't, but like, just keep them washed. I know, I know, I, I um, thought about that. I love beards, so I just don't want you to get, you know. Right, exactly. Um, Okay, uh, someone asked this question. Okay. I think you answered it, but just in case. Okay. Um, we're at the two minute mark, so it's about to cut me off. Okay. So let's see. Uh, what changes would you like to see in fashion for people with disabilities? 10 seconds. <laughs> I just want them to be included as fashion customers. So I literally want to see clothing designed by major designers with disability in mind. Okay, awesome. So a question just came in through the comments. 20 seconds if you can. Um, she said, I have swollen feet due to being in a wheelchair. How can I find pretty shoes with no heels? I can't wear heels. I have totally, I have total feeling in my body. Um, I curate some different footwear on my website. And what I'll do is I'll pull some things and then I'll give you some brands because uh, what you just need to find something that has a wider width and you may need to mm -hmm. get it a size larger, but a really cute closed toe shoe that may even mm -hmm. have a little pull. I'd have to see what your feet look like, but that would be helpful. Okay, wonderful. Well, Stephanie, as we are counting down, Thank you so much for being the inaugural guest of The New Narrative. Everyone, please follow Stephanie right now. Make sure you visit her website and check in next week when we will have a new guest so we can talk about the new narrative that we want to have for the disability community. Yes, and the, the new site will be up probably, I don't know when it'll 20 hit. 20 seconds. <laughs> it'll hit tonight or tomorrow, so if you go there and it looks the same, just keep checking okay. back over the And the chat will be saved on my IGTV so you guys can go back and catch any notes or any extra information. All right, you guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Lolo. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> okay. This is going three seconds. Two, one. One.